Okay, well, a special welcome to those of you who will be seeing this not today. Uh, we'll be seeing this sometime this coming week uh, to our second and a half week of Advent uh, as we are looking at the theme of the coming Lamb. Uh, again, we're taking a little break from Luke, uh, away from our typical pattern of going through uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and so forth to look at this theme uh, as we anticipate Christmas in the coming of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. And last week we talked about the forever Lamb. We saw how in John chapter 1, um, as John begins what we call the prologue to his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Uh, we saw that it is very easily inserted, not to do violence to scripture, but to understand that as we, we see Jesus being reflected in John's words that we see uh, in the beginning was the lamb and the lamb was with God. The lamb was God, as we saw all the way forward to Revelation uh, chapter 13, where it, we, we have this book of life, the lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. So it's always God's purpose. It has always been God's purpose to have this lamb, the eternal lamb, the eternal son of God to take take on flesh and to dwell among a fallen people to redeem us for himself. So we looked at that last week and we're going to focus very specifically this morning on the coming of the lamb for a particular purpose. And it is as uh, John the Baptist will continue on in John chapter one, John the Baptist cries out as he sees Jesus and he is, he is calling to the people who have been listening to him. He had quite a following, quite a crowd. He says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold this lamb. And so it's, it's our desire this morning to behold this lamb, to behold Jesus as the one who takes away the sin of the world. I'm going to give you a little asterisk to begin with this morning. The Bible is not, uh, it, it does not teach what we'll call universalism. Okay, so I just want to kind of give you a little caveat here to start because it, it might be tempting to say, okay, well, if Jesus takes away the sin of the world, well, that's great. Everybody can be happy. Everybody's good. Uh, and that, that's not the point here that John is making because as Jesus comes on the scene, as he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the thing that you need to be struck by is this. It's not this, this, this teaching of, you know, well, everybody is just saved. Everybody's wonderful. Everybody's fine because the whole Bible makes it very clear that's not the case, that there is a people, however, However, a people from among every tribe and language and people and nation that this lamb, Jesus, has come. And that as John says this, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is saying this is far greater than a lamb who came to deal with this ethnic people of Israel. This lamb has come to ransom a people from every tribe and language and people and nation. If you've ever done ancestry DNA or something like that, you'll realize if you're an American, most likely you have a whole lot of those different tribes, language, peoples, and nations represented in your bloodstream. But the point that John is making is, look, this is a lamb who has come, this forever lamb from all of eternity has come in order to redeem a people from around the whole globe. And this we'll see as we move toward the end of the message this morning, we'll see is something that God has given this precious, precious gift to those who will treasure this lamb and his work. So that if you behold this lamb who comes to take up the sin of a people from around the whole world, if you behold him and you treasure him and your confidence in him, your trust is in him, you'll find that your sin is taken up by this lamb. And that's the most exciting reality. It's, it's the core of the gospel that we preach. So behold the lamb. John chapter 1, verses 19 through 30. We're picking up from last week. I'll read this for us this morning before we go any further. So John, the apostle, picks up here and gives this testimony about John the Baptist. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. 
even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Now, we're just going to hearken back a little bit to last week and even further back to when we began the Gospel of Luke, boy, back in 2021. John the Baptist is older physically than Jesus, right? The promise of John the Baptist's birth uh, was, was given before Jesus became incarnate. And so when John the Baptist says here, he was before me, he's making a very clear point, just like the whole rest of this gospel record makes this point that Jesus is somebody far greater. Jesus is somebody far mightier. And, and as Jesus himself said, that no one born among the children of, of men is as great a man as John the Baptist. So you have this guy who's just the greatest He's a paragon of virtue. He is the height, the cream of the crop among men. And yet John says, I have nothing. I I don't hold a candle to this one because he was before me because John knew that this one was the word made flesh, the eternal son of God. And as Jesus steps on the scene, He says, behold, and I I don't want you to make the mistake of thinking that this is kind of one of those uh, uh, archaic words like behold. This This is John saying, look, 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 look who's here. And that's what he wants for us to do this morning. So here's our big idea, beholding Jesus as the forever lamb which is what we walked away from last week with entails beholding him as the lamb who came to take away sin. So it's not just enough to see Jesus as the one who was in the beginning with God, who in the beginning was God, but it is entirely appropriate for us to understand the identity of Jesus, of the eternal son of the eternal lamb of God, to, to understand that you can't see him rightly unless you see him as fulfilling this very central, very, very critical work. It's, it's the delight of Jesus to take upon himself this identity as the one who would take away sin and we'll, we'll move toward that this morning. We're going to take a little bit more of a look here at John the Baptist as, as he helps us understand a bit more a purpose to point. So back in John 1, 19 through 23, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, so John the Baptist said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. So we we have here these individuals. and, And again, there's this following, this crowd that had been gathering around John the Baptist for some time. And people had gone out and and even people who did not even really care to grasp the heart of what John the Baptist was doing and preaching this this call to repent. As as John the Baptist went out, he was was preaching, saying, rethink your sin, turn away from this love and treasuring of sin, because one is coming who is going to do this purifying work, and he is going to be one who basically sets this dividing line among humanity and it, is, it would do you well to turn away from this loving of sin because when this one comes, it's not, it's not going to be able to dovetail. Your love for sin and this one who is greater than all coming, it's not going to be able to work together. You have to turn away from this treasuring of things other than the one who is to come. And so John's been preaching this message and, and these people, these religious individuals and non-religious individual, individuals who came to John the Baptist, whole different types of people coming to him came and and they were so excited that this man was here because they thought well perhaps perhaps this one who had come is is going to be something that they could follow in a very unique way you you have to remember that for about 3 to 400 years at this point 
the people had been uh, kept in silence from hearing the word of God. You have the, the end of the Old Testament, which is the end of God's record speaking until uh, John the Baptist really steps on the scene of the book of Malachi. And there's this promise that somebody is going to come and, and he is going to prepare the way and that the Lord will come upon the heels of the one who is going to preach this type of message. And so they're very excited at this point that John has come. And, and so they're going to him and they're saying, John, tell us who you are. Tell us who you are. And for all intents and purposes, John probably had a more popular following than Jesus did. Until Jesus starts doing these broad scale signs pointing to his identity, John the Baptist had this huge, tremendous following, people going out to him to visit him, to hear what he had to say. And so they, they were very curious as to what John was going to be preaching. And so they go to him, they ask these questions, who are you, John? Who are you, John? Who are you, John? And John is very clear here that he has come to serve a particular point and that John's entire life, his entire ministry, all of this calls to repentance, all this preaching that he's been doing, that the crowds that have been gathering, it's to serve a very specific purpose. And it is to point to one who is to come so that when we find the words that come in verse 29, when John says to behold the Lamb of God, he is, he is saying effectively, my entire life has led to this point. My entire life has led to this point because this one who was before me has now come. This one who has come is greater than me. This one who, who is coming is, is I am not worthy to untie his sandals, to wash his feet, to do anything, to do anything with him except to just fall down before him. Uh, more of that to come. Because Jesus is the forever lamb, John the Baptist knew himself to hold the delightful position of preparer and pointer. So when I say delightful position here, here's what I mean. John is self-aware as people are coming to him and asking him. As, as he is preaching, John is self-aware. He's like, this is not for me. I'm not trying to gather crowds for myself. It surely would have been a temptation for him. It surely would have been a temptation for him to see that all of these people really, even though they're kind of turned off by me, they still like me somehow. And John could have drawn a crowd for himself, and yet he delights to speak of Jesus who was coming, and the purpose of his coming will be highlighted. Isaiah chapter 40, here is what John is referencing, as he is saying, here's who I really am. The prophet Isaiah is this kind of turning point in the book. 39 chapters are done. The 40th chapter sets in, and it's all of this talk, this beautiful poetry that unfolds about God's purposes to save a people. And verses one through five, here's what it says. I want you to identify where John the Baptist fits in. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she is received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries. John's voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So this, this passage is very familiar to the people. Isaiah is somebody we would call one of the major prophets, not like he was more important, but his work is much more voluminous. There's a lot more of Isaiah to read than you find in, in Habakkuk. And so the, the people have been very familiar. It's kind of like if you grow up in church, you think about, oh, Romans, I know Romans. You, you might not know uh, much about Second Thessalonians, but Romans, you might know a lot about that. Well, the Jews of the first century would have heard Isaiah and heard Isaiah quoted and said, this Ooh, this is big. This is remarkable. This is Isaiah chapter 40. Pictures of a big God are present in Isaiah chapter 40. And so he, he says, here's who I am. I am the voice of one who is crying in the wilderness to prepare the way for 
Yahweh. To prepare the way for the Lord, to prepare the way for the one who was and who is and who is to come. As God's covenant name is used, Yahweh, God's covenant names, as he's revealing himself to the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 3, he's, he's talking to Moses and he says to Moses, as Moses asked the question, who should I say sent me? God says, tell them that I am has sent me. That's what is communicated to Moses. And so as Isaiah is, is here, he's saying there's somebody who's going to come. And as, as this one comes, he's going to prepare the way for I am. He's going to prepare the way for the Lord to come and to break into this world and to, to speak to a people who had known great and terrible turmoil and heartbreak because of their sin. And John says, I'm, I'm here to do this. And, and so we, we find as this, as this plays out here, as Jesus comes on the scene, then as John points here, there's, there's a passage in John chapter three, you may be familiar with it, but I, I want to draw your attention here so you understand that there is this delightful purpose that John embraces for himself as he sees it. I'm the voice and that's it. I'm just a voice in the wilderness crying something. I'm, I'm here to declare something, to point you to someone for a very particular purpose that is great, significant in the scope of history. John chapter three, the discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purifications. They're talking theology and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness. He's talking about Jesus. Look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So they were well aware as John had been teaching. This is what he's been saying the whole time. He goes on to say, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John is saying, look, my whole life, my whole life's purpose has been pointing to this. And, and we'll see in just a few minutes that uh, I'll, I'll argue for you, I'll argue for you to understand this, that the entire purpose of history points to the same thing that John the Baptist is pointing to with his words and his life here. That the purpose of everything is that a watching world would behold this forever lamb coming in to lay his life down for undeserving sinners. And so as John's crowd starts dispersing, as his following starts to leave him, he's saying, I am so glad you're leaving, not because I don't like you, but because I can now point you directly to the lamb. So that's where we find John. That's where we find Jesus as this, this statement, this exclamation comes. Behold your lamb, John 1, 29 through 30. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. So John's call to behold the coming glory of the Lord was a call to behold that glory displayed in the most unexpected of ways through the coming of the Lord as a sin-bearing lamb. So imagine then if you are one of John the Baptist's disciples and you hear him making these statements and he's saying, I'm pointing forward, I'm pointing forward, I'm pointing forward, and I am preaching in such a way that, that, that the hearts of fathers and their children are being brought back together, that people who have been living lives that are completely inconsistent with the character and holiness of God are being turned back around. Uh, people are, are being set on a path here to receive the Lord who is coming in his glory, and they're thinking, okay, this is coming, and, and this is going to be wonderful, and this is great, and so as Jesus comes on the scene, they're expecting that Jesus is going to fulfill a particular pattern for glory. Glory. And this pattern that they expect is a, is a, is a pattern that is, that is absolutely broken apart. Because they had been expecting a pattern of popularity and power. They've been expecting a pattern whereby this coming one 
This Lord who would come in glory to meet his people would, would not only vindicate his people, but would vindicate them in such a way that would exalt them and, and would provide them with a sense of significance, not because uh, a God had come who knew them in their misery and their need for redemption and forgiveness, but the Lord would come and would say, it's time for you to be counted the most significant among this world. It's time for you to be raised up and set in a position of authority. And yet, as John the Baptist is fulfilling his role of preparing the way for the Lord, the the craziest words come out of his mouth as he is pointing them to the Lord. When he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you have been around the church for any length of time, this kind of language will sound just kind of familiar and it will sound like, okay, yeah, I get it. Jesus, Lamb of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the imagery will be in your head and this type of thing. But just put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is expecting the glory of the Lord to come and the glory of the Lord is being revealed by John the Baptist, the apex of his ministry. And he says, look at this lamb. Look at this lamb. As I mentioned last week, even for us, like in the church today, we, we have these posters in Christian bookstores that have a picture of Jesus represented as this lion. It's this majestic lion who's, who's on here and all the names of God. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but the, the, the picture that we have in Revelation of the conquering Jesus, of the conquering king who has come and who sits on a throne is a picture of a lamb. Like we just don't like the idea that our glorious Lord wants us to see him primarily in this capacity. The expectation among these people and, and the desire we have in our hearts today to like look at Jesus and say, hmm, how important, how significant is Jesus? And it's true, he is the most important, significant being in the entire universe, but we want to see that type of significance and glory in a different way than, than John the Baptist wants us to see it and that God himself wants us to see it, that this glory is being displayed in a unique way. This glory is being displayed as the eternal son is a lamb. A lamb was good in the first century for eating or for slaughtering. Eating or slaughtering. There's no ASPCA, there's no Humane Society that has the, the, you know, the, the catalog of lambs that need adoption as pets. Lambs were for eating or for slaughtering. You would have lamb for supper, lamb hamburgers, whatever made lamb out of, have that for supper, or you would see this whole multitude as you think shepherds are out there and they're, they're herding their flocks. They'd herd them because they knew the time for sacrifice was coming. And so uh, day after day, as the people saw the need for their sin to be addressed in some capacity before God, they, they have these lambs and they take them and they'd slaughter them and they'd slaughter them and they'd slaughter them. So if you're a Jew in the first century, you hear the lamb of God, you're like, man, I, I, supper or slaughter? Supper or slaughter? And there ain't nothing special about either of those. So what an epic letdown in their mind when the, must this have been. The glory of the Lord is coming. Behold, supper slaughter. And then to finish out the imagery, John says, behold, this lamb was taken away the sin of the world. Like how offensive must that have been for a self-important Jew in the first century saying, we really want this Lord to come on the scene and vindicate us for these nasty, dirty Gentiles around us who have taken over our land. Let's throw them off. Let's buck them off. And this conquering King is going to come. And John says, and behold, supper or slaughter. And he's going to take away the sin, not just of you Jews, but of the Gentiles as well. The glory of the Lord revealed in this 
particular way is so offensive. This is why the gospel is so offensive to us even to this day is because the expectations we have of what God's purpose is for us to exalt us, to enhance our lives in some way other than giving us forgiveness of sin, pardon of sin, of, of a reconciled relationship with him. All of these impressions we have, it just seems like this doesn't seem like something I want very much. So John the Baptist's ministry was so significant in part because as he's preaching repentance, he's saying, you need something, you need a lamb. Because as he's reminding them over and over of sin, he's reminding them, turn from sin, turn from sin, turn from sin. In their minds, sin, okay, but sin, sin has to be dealt with somehow. It's not, I just can't turn away from it. It has to be forgiven. It has to be cleansed somehow. And so for those among John's disciples would have remembered this, they would have heard, okay, this might seem entirely insignificant to a whole bunch of people, but I know this. I know that my sin, which I've been painfully aware of for however long I've been hearing this preaching from John the Baptist, my sin, it has to be dealt with. And look, God has supplied a lamb to take it away. If you remember last week, we, we looked at how Isaac, Abraham's son, is led up Mount Moriah, and he asked the question of his father, Dad, Dad, I see the wood. I see the wood for the burnt offering. Where's the lamb? Where is it, Dad? And Abraham says to his son, God himself will provide a lamb. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years pointing forward. And they finally culminate here with John the Baptist. So for those who think, man, I really don't have a need for this. But then there are those who think, yeah, I, a lamb. I need a lamb because I have sin and I need something to stand in the place of that sin. I need something to cover that sin. Behold the lamb of God. God has provided a lamb to take away my sin. Isaiah 46 through 11, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go, up, go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news preacher of the gospel, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. So as John is preaching, he's this herald of good news, and he's saying to the people, well, I want you to be a preacher of the good news, and here's how you're going to preach the good news. You're going to preach the good news of your God who's come. Behold him. Behold the Lamb. Go forward, a handful of chapters in Isaiah's book, and you hear what's probably the most um, quoted prophecy regarding the coming of Jesus and, and just his person and his work about the, the suffering servant. But Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, is something that I think is important for us to understand as we think about John's call to behold the Lamb of God. Because Isaiah leads out this chapter by saying this. He says, Lord, who's believed our message? And I, I want you to consider, again, just marry this idea in your head. Marry this idea of who, who's believed this message of the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. How desirable is that really? How wise does that sound? You can, you can walk in this, in this day and age, walk into Walmart and you can go to the book section and you can find in their quote, Christian book section, books that talk about the Christian life as this enhancement project. And you know, God's, God's real role in your life is to make you the best version of who you think you should be. That God's great work for you is to give you your best life now and 
Isaiah says about this message, been trusted a priest, like who's believed our message? Nobody wants to believe this kind of message. Everybody wants to believe that God is here to praise you. Nobody wants to, and nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna show up at Walmart and put this book out that says, behold, your God, a crucified lamb. I mean, it's not gonna sell. Behold, the eternal King of glory in all humility, taking on the form of a lamb, common lamb, all over the place. Supper or slaughter, all over the place. Behold him. Behold him. And Isaiah says, as, as he is preaching to a people who just, they want self-exaltation. They're threatened with judgment in Isaiah's day, that the judgment is coming. The judgment will come on the people. Jerusalem will be destroyed. It'll be devastated. And he's saying, get your act together, guys. God's great work is not to make much of you. And yet they keep saying, we think we can make it that way. And so in Isaiah's day, he's like, who's believed our message? John's day, who's believed the message of a lamb? Our day, who's believed the message of a lamb who's come? So he goes on to say this then. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew, and this is talking about Jesus. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, upon the Lamb of God, was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is a silent, so he op opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. So as John is out preparing the way for the Lord, he gets to this point and he says, behold the Lamb of God, behold the suffering servant. Behold the one who came to bear the sin of his people. Before we go any further this morning, I just want you to, just want you to think about when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at the end of the day, if you're honest with yourself, what do you, what do you think is your greatest need? As you go throughout your day and you think, man, if I, if I could have, if I could just like ask God for something right now, what could I have from him that would just make everything better? And the answer, if we're, any of us are left to ourselves, the answer is going to be, man, I could, I could use like $100,000. I, I could use a, a new car. I could use a new house. Right? Fill in the blank with all these things. And yet God says that your need, this is what he was this is what he came. This is what Jesus came specifically to meet. Is his need? Is you wake up in the morning, you think, "I have sinned against God." I 
I think, man, yesterday, I wake up this morning. Yesterday, I did this. Man, this haunts me. This is so stupid of me to do. Or you go to bed tonight and you think, man, I said this. I should not have said this. That was not smart. This was so dumb. And not only was it dumb because like it hurt somebody else, but I know that I have a God who made me, who is holy and perfect and good, and I've offended him. And, and God says, I want you to understand this, that my son and his coming is come to deal with that. And if you strip everything back and you consider the significance of John's message, why he's so joyful, why he's so happy, it's because John himself knew he's like, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. You know why? Because I'm a sinner. I've offended God. Every single breath I have taken has not been for his glory has not been to display his worth and his greatness. I've taken these breaths and it's been stupid things here and there. I've been belittling God. I've been trying to make much of myself. And John says, I'm so excited. I'm so happy because the Lamb of God has come to take away my sin. This this is a message that doesn't preach well if people don't understand the need. And one of the deepest concerns that I have when I think about our culture today is like, and you you think what what happened when all of us get these stimulus checks during COVID, right? We get these stimulus checks in the mail. Everybody's thinking, what am I going to get with my stimulus check? I'm going to get a new TV. Because in our mind, we're thinking, okay, I have a a 42-inch TV. I need a 65-inch TV. Let's get a 65-inch TV. And you know, all day long we're thinking, what do, what do we need? What do we need? What do we, 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 we need this, we need this, we need this. And God is saying, don't let this obscure your vision of what your most significant need is and what the most significant pressing need is for all of humanity throughout all of history. And that's you have offended me and yet I will provide the lamb. Forget the TVs, like forget the TVs, forget these other things. If you have the lamb, you have your greatest need met. And so this message, I may not preach well with this type of thing, concerns me to think that we just are so in love with all these different ideas, but this is not just unique to us, but we have our own specific issues we deal with in this culture and it all revolves around this. Like we just don't think we need a lamb. And John is in his preaching said, you need a lamb, you need a lamb, you need a lamb, and here's the lamb. The lamb has come. And so to just the bigger picture, I want you to see the lamb's purpose. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here's what I'm going to argue for. And here's, here's what I want you to, to find in your place in human history. Okay. And when you are tempted this week to think, eh, I, 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 I don't know that there's much significant about my life. I don't know that there's anything about me that's, that's really, I just kind of, nah. Later today, a lot of us are going to watch football, watch people who make lots and lots and lots more money than we'll ever make. We think, wow, they're pretty important people, right? If you understand the coming of the Lamb, you understand the purpose of the Lamb throughout the scope of human history, you can like look at yourself and say, I get to take part in something much more significant than a $100 million paycheck. So here's what I'll argue. The whole universe exists to display the glory of God beheld in the triumphant, sin-bearing, people-purchasing work of the forever lamb. Here's... Here's where I'm going to take this from, okay? As, as, as we looked last week at Revelation chapter 13, it's this, this end picture, okay? It's this, this picture of how everything gets summed up as, as the Apostle John is given this vision, these different facets, these different perspectives on the culmination of all things, and he's talking about the, the, the significance, the importance of all this stuff, and over and over and over, there's this imagery of this lamb who sits on a throne, and over and over, we see that this is, this is something more significant than you could ever imagine, and so we're going to go back here now to put this in the context of when, when John the Baptist is saying, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he's, he's pointing you not just something like, okay, just for you you personally, and you can kind of keep it to you and yourself. This is a global issue. 
When, when we as a church support missions and we support those who will go and preach the gospel to, to people that are not just right here, even though there are tens of thousands of people right here who don't know Jesus, we, we are participating in this task that is a global task because the, the global task of missions is not ultimately just to see like individuals in different countries know Jesus, but so that the, the glory of Jesus would be beheld among people around the whole world because that's why this world exists. So Revelation chapter five, I'm going to let God speak to you to this end. So you can believe him. If you don't believe me, believe him. Revelation five, then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. Now, just to give you a little aside here, I'm not going to explain all the imagery. All right, that's another time, another place. Maybe this summer, in fact, we'll take a look at some things in Revelation. Pastor Josh and Wausau will be doing that, from what I understand. Uh, so you can at least tune in for those sermons as they come out. But there's a lot to be said here. I'm not going to go into the details. So just think big picture before we go into the details on this one. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David is conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So lion, lion's here, the lion's here. But look, look who John sees. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, they saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. Why are you worthy, lamb? Why are you worthy to take this scroll? The whole purpose of history in this scroll bound up. Why are you worthy? It's because you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So here's this picture. And, and God wants us to see as he's giving this vision to the apostle John. He's like, look at what everything is for everything, every living creature, the sea on the earth and the air, birds and, and bugs, creepy fish you don't want to look at because it's crawling around in the bottom of the ocean, all nasty, you no know, eyes, everything, all these things exist for the glory of the lamb. Everything. So when John says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, you see this, this is tied to it because he says this lamb has been slain and the worthiness of this lamb to receive all of this worship, to receive all of this honor for all of creation is, is pointing to the slain lamb and saying, worthy are you because by your blood, you've ransomed a people as he says, take away the sin of the world, people from every tribe and language and people and nation, not just Jews. People in Germany, people in Australia, people in Madagascar, people in Colombia, people all over the place. By your blood, Jesus, you've ransomed them. This is a global glory. And as John is pointing that, I mean, just think about how joyful he would have been. I get to see him. I see the lamb. And my purpose here is done because I've pointed people to the lamb. And so for us, as we think about our place now, this is celebrating Advent and the coming of the lamb. We think, okay, last week we saw the forever lamb. He's always been, he always will be. I think, how do you, how do you enjoy this now? I think, man, Jesus, your, your blood it's there. 
and it's there to take up my sin. And so as you think about this this week, you think, okay, glory, lamb, slain, behold, glory, behold, lamb, slain, my sin taken up in him. If, if you're going to celebrate Advent, you have an Advent calendar. We have a we calendar as a family. We read through the Christmas story, 25 days of, of, of preparing for the coming of Jesus, reading this Advent calendar, putting little, little figures up and Velcro and everything like that. Here's how you really, really celebrate Advent, how you really celebrate Jesus, not just at Advent. You celebrate him by saying, Jesus, your blood, your blood is, is it's there for my sin. Jesus, you're, you're the slaughtered lamb. You're the slaughtered lamb. You're not there for me to go to and treat like a genie in a bottle. You're there so that I can find my sin taken away. That was John's delight. That is the global glory of the lamb as people worship him. saying, you've been slain and you have taken away the sin of people. So we've got a couple more weeks left in Advent. And so I just just want this to kind of help us put perspective for the rest of the time. You're going to celebrate Jesus rightly if you keep this right at the core, right at the center. Don't, don't let Christmas, don't let Advent be something about a little baby in a manger. And that's nice and everything. It's slaughtered lamb, slaughtered lamb, slaughtered lamb. Glory is there. So worship team, would you please come up? And uh, let's pray together. We'll finish the morning in song. Father, we thank you for sending your son into the world to be a slaughtered lamb. And in that slaughtered lambness, he is worthy of all glory and praise and honor among all of the tribes and languages and peoples and nations of this world. And he is worthy of it among all of the little creatures that exist, little rodents and giant whales and all these things you've made, they, they will praise you in some way. Jesus is the slaughtered lamb. I pray that as we finish the morning here in song, you would give our hearts a sense of just treasuring, treasuring of you. Would you please do this so that you would get glory and that we would get joy for Jesus' sake, Father. Amen. Stand, please.